Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. That's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And, and what, we're, what we've looked at is the Beatitudes and, and just all of this stuff. And in, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, we've really focused on Jesus taking things from the external to the internal. He's taking these law, these habits, these, these traditions, these rules, these regulations that we follow externally, and he's taking them and he's challenging these Jewish people, the disciples, and, and he's saying, okay, so you've heard this. What I want to do now is I want to color this in for you. I want to complete your understanding of this, and, and I want to show you that it's more than just outward actions. And that's really been the, the overwhelming theme throughout the last few weeks. And I've asked, I don't know how many times, and I'm going to ask it more today, this, this same question over and over again, because you guys, I, I, I fear for our church in America. I fear that the church in America is a church that's filled, again, with outward actions and, and the appearance of things, because this is so much what's important to us. And I fear that our hearts are far from God. I fear that we are, like Isaiah prophesied, we are those who worship in vain, we say things with our lips, but our hearts are far, far, far from him. And, and as a church, as a leader, my heart's desire is that we would be a people whose hearts are committed to the Lord. Not a people who externally do the right things, but a people who love God in our hearts, in the control center of our being. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus challenges us. He says, when you do these things... And then he goes on and he talks about three specific things. And if you have your pen or your phones, get your phones out if you don't have it out, because I want you to take some notes. Real quickly, um, I, I talked to the youth on Wednesday, and Casey's smiling because she's already got this in her notes. But um, on Wednesday night, I challenged our youth kids, because they get the same stuff you guys get on Sundays. They get it that following Wednesday. And what I challenged them with is this, to form new habits. Some of you that are TV watchers, um, I, I don't watch a lot of regular network television, but for some reason, when I do, I've seen this commercial numerous times. And, and what this commercial is, is it's, it's cigarette companies, and what they're doing is they're, they're, it's an anti-cigarette commercial, and they talk about the statistics of how the cigarette companies really try and focus on young people. Because if they can get young people to start smoking, then they have a little more security in their industry until they kill that young person. <laughs> But then they got to replenish. And so the whole goal of, of their marketing or the whole goal of their, their sales and their thought process is we got to get them young. Because if we can get them young, if we can get them to form this habit, if, we, if I can get Kyle and Courtney to form this habit, then I got them. Because they got this habit. And once they have this habit, it's really hard to break. And so as I was thinking about that for our youth kids, I thought, you know what? They've spent millions billions of dollars in research to figure out a strategy to hook people, to hook young people, which means it must be pretty effective. Maybe we should do the same thing. And so what I challenged our young people with Wednesday night was to do this, form three new, new habits. Form three new habits. Casey, are you 15? Almost 15. See, there will come a time where you get mad at a guy for calling you older than you really are. Right now, we're still safe, I think. So Casey's almost 15. If we can get Casey to form these three new habits, they're likely to stay with her for the rest of her life. And here are these three new habits. This is what I want you guys to write down or put in your phones. Because genuinely, you guys, I would love to see us as a church, as individuals, form these three habits. They're the three things that Jesus basically expects followers of his to do. He says it in Matthew chapter 6. And when you help the needy. And when you give, that's the first thing, help people. The first, the first habit I want you to form, us to form, is to help people. It should be part of the DNA as a Christian, part of who we are, part of what's in our being. I challenge the kids, our DNA, when we get saved, this is a picture of our DNA. All of a sudden you get saved and you go from being the selfish person where it's all about me and, and the Lord takes this rung from your DNA ladder and he tears it out supernaturally, spiritually, he tears out that rung of selfishness, and all of a sudden, he puts in a new rung, and it's a rung that says, you're a follower of Jesus, now you're going to place others before you. You're going to help people. That's the first habit, church, that I want to encourage you to form. Help people. The second habit is this. Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 6, and he says, and when you pray, that's the second thing. 
form the habit of prayer. Now, now uh, studies show that it takes 20 to 50 days to form a new habit. 20 to 50. But once you form it, it's hard to break new habits. Amen? Form the habit of praying. We need to be a praying body. It's expected of us. And finally, the third thing is this. And when you fast. Here's the thing with fasting. Fasting, it's not something we do so that we can brag about it. That's Jesus, the other theme in here. The whole theme is don't do your good deeds before others. Don't do them to gain the applause of people. Do them for God. Do them because you're committed to him. Do them because you're a follower of Jesus. He says, and when you fast, fasting is simply this. It's putting aside a physical need. It's putting aside your flesh, starving your flesh to focus on the spiritual. Saying, God, I'm going to be in control of this disaster right here. I'm going to be in control. I'm going to choose what I'm going to do, whether it's food, whether it's if, if it's media, if it's, if it's television, if, whatever it is, maybe all of your time is spent with your friends and, and you need to say, Lord, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take an hour just for you. But whatever it is, it's starving the physical to focus on the spiritual, and it's an expected thing. Those are three new habits, church, that I want to encourage you to start forming today because they're more likely to stay with you. And I know for some, ha having shared this with the youth, I look at these kids and I think for you guys, it's, you're at this point where you, you can still, you can turn. You're like Ferraris. That's what you guys are like. You're like Ferraris. You can, you can turn on a dime. You know what I mean? Like corner, you corner well and, and you handle nicely and you can go fast and then you can stop. And you get old like Alan. <laughs> and everything's different. <laughs> but you guys, here's the deal. I'm talking to youth, but I'm also talking to us old folks. It's not too late. Many of us think, I'm already 40, I'm already 50, I'm already 60. What's the point? The point is you're a Christian, and your life is to honor God and to glorify Him and to worship Him. It's never too late to start these new things. Just do it. So that that's kind of brings us up to where we are today. Jesus is dealing with us. He's dealing with our hearts, and, and that's what He does. And today, believe it or not, you guys, we're going we're gonna to wrap up Matthew chapter 6, and I know for some of you, you thought it was maybe going to be 2020 when we finish chapter 6, but it's going to happen today. Jesus goes on, and, and he's challenging us in Matthew chapter 6, um, starting in verse 19, and, and, and he brings all of this kind of together now, I believe, in these next statements. Up till now, what Jesus has been saying is, don't, don't do things for the attention and the reward of other people, because if you do, that's all the reward you're going to get. Instead, he says, do things in secret so that you receive the reward from your Father in heaven. He brings it together now with this next chunk of Scripture. Remember, we read things in context. We don't pull out a chunk and decide this is what he means. We try and decipher, Jesus, what are you saying in the context of this whole conversation? And that's where we are in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Jesus says this, he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires, the desires of your heart will also be. Verse 22, he says this, interesting statement. He says, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. When your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and and money. And I'm going to stop right there for right now and just address a few of the things that Jesus is talking about. First of all, again, he brings us to this. What, what reward do you want? Believers? Followers? Disciples? What reward do you want? Do you want the applause of men? Do you want these treasures here on earth that, that, that are going to go away, that can burn, that can be destroyed? Or do you want the reward from, from your Father in heaven, the eternal reward? that will last forever. That's what Jesus says. He says, don't, don't store up these treasures. This, this isn't where it's at. 
It, 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 it can burn away. It can be destroyed. Instead, he says, store up these treasures in heaven for where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart is. And here's the deal what he's talking about with your heart. I, I, I just have an interesting picture. Um, yesterday when we were at Dago's, uh, Chris was showing Jason this computer setup that he had. Uh, I believe it's a gaming computer. And, and so I, I just, I'm sitting back. I don't know nothing about nothing <laughs> when it comes to that stuff. So I'm just sitting back, just kind of overhearing this conversation. And, and I, but I looked, and his keyboard changes colors. There's lights underneath it. It's, it's like a pimped out keyboard that changes colors. And so the keyboard changes colors, and, and there's the mouse, and there's a screen for video games that's like this big. It's not that big, but it's a big screen. And, and as I'm listening to this conversation, this thought enters my head. All of that's worthless. This really cool looking screen, the pimped out keyboard, this fancy mouse, all of it is worthless without that tower, without that computer, because that's where the business is. You know what I mean? That's the deal right there. The processor, the, all of the other jargon stuff that it's filled with. That's your heart, church. Because what that's filled with is what comes out. If that, if that tower, if that control center is not filled with enough speed, if it doesn't have a fast enough processor, if it doesn't have a big enough hard drive, if there's not enough memory, if there's not all this stuff, it doesn't matter how cool the monitor looks. It doesn't matter how pimped out the keyboard is. It doesn't matter how fancy the mouse is or the mouse pad that it sits on. It doesn't matter. It's the control center, and that's what Jesus is talking about here when he says where your heart is. Understand this, you guys, understand this. Where your heart is, that's the control center of your life, your heart. It's so important, you guys, it's so important that we, we, we focus inward and stop looking outward. Am I making it look right? Am I singing in a way to impress the church? Am I worshiping in a way to make it look right because now there's people here that I want to impress Am I going to raise my hands in church because there's visitors here, because so-and-so is here? Am I going to raise them because I brought my kids and my grandkids and my brothers here? Am I going to raise them because there's other pastors in the room? Am I going to do this stuff outwardly because I want to impress somebody else? Because that's not where it's at. That's a worthless monitor that just serves to look good. What Jesus says here to us as disciples is, where is your heart at? Where is it? Where are you looking to store up treasures? Because where you're looking to store up treasures, friends, is where your heart is. That is the control center of your life. And if the treasures you're looking to store up are the things in this world that moth and rust can destroy, then that's exactly what will happen. They will go away. But if the treasures that you're looking to store up are the treasures in heaven, God, when I pray, God, when I fast, God, when I give, God, when I worship, God, when I serve, I want to do it all for you. I want to do it all for your glory. I want to do it all for the reward that you have for me. Now, you're storing up treasures in heaven. And that's what Jesus says to do. He goes on and he makes this, I think, kind of a funny statement. If, if you don't study and understand, he starts talking about our eyes. <laughs> it's like, you're looking at the context like, Lord, what are you talking about? Our eyes. If your eye is good and your eye is bad. That, we're talking about money here. We're talking about our heart. What are you talking about? Well, well, here's what he's talking about. Looking back into the Greek words of this, what he's talking about is, if you have a good eye, that means you're generous. It means you see the need of others and you respond to it. He says, if you have a bad eye, that means you're stingy. And to the people that he's talking to, they understand everything he's talking about. They understand what he's saying. A good eye, you see the need, and because you're a follower of Jesus, because your, your DNA has changed, you see the need and you respond to it. You give, you help, you serve. You have a good eye. Then he goes on, and I think he makes this even more powerful statement, and, and I can't even tell you how many times I've read this, and, and it, this this is just now through this sermon uh, really coming out for me. Is he, he says this, and, and if you think, and if you think you have a good eye, but really you have a bad eye, how bad is it? 
If you think you have the light in you, but really you're filled with darkness, how dark you really are. Because you're fooling yourself. And, and you guys, as I'm looking at that, I'm like, Holy Spirit, man, you got to speak to us. Holy Spirit, you got to change our hearts. Because again, church, I believe we are filled in our country, in our state. I believe we're filled in this community with Christians who think, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. And just because we think that, we're fooling ourselves. And how deep, Jesus says, how deep and how dark that it really is inside of you. Because we're fooling ourselves. Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts right now? Holy Spirit, would you, would you convict us? Would you, would you speak truth to us right now? And reveal that darkness so that we can be a body, so that we can be a beacon in this community. Jesus goes on. He says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And, and what he's saying here is, if you're going to go this route, if your focus is going to be all on your earthly treasures, that becomes your God. And you can't do both. You can't, you can't have all of your focus be on this and think you can also serve and love God doesn't mean you can't have money. You guys, I know some people that are wealthy beyond what I can imagine. And you would never, ever know it. They could be sitting in your presence. You would never know it. They could drive up. You would never know it. You could have conversation. You would never know it. You would never know it. Do you know why? Because they know who their God is. Because they know who they serve. They know who, who, their, who their Savior is. Their heart is is in the right spot, and they have good eyes. And I believe this, I believe the Lord just continues to shower on them to their dismay. He continues to shower on them these funds. And you know what they do? They say, we don't know what, what we don't, I, I don't know. But you know what they do? They keep giving. They keep serving. They keep, they keep uh, providing. Because they understand this is all from God. You see, having money is not the problem. Worshiping money, worshiping earthly treasures, that's the problem. And that's what he's talking about. Church, again, and I ask it, don't, don't, don't fall asleep. Where's your heart today? Sitting in church? That's great. Praise God that you're here, and I'm so glad. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, it doesn't matter. I'm so happy you're here. But I want to tell you something. Coming to church, is not, it's not, that's not it. The Lord is after our hearts. I want, to, I want to encourage us with something today. Turn with me in your Bibles. And put, put something in, in Matthew right there to hold your spot. And turn with me to Proverbs. And let's, go, let's start with Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. And you guys, even if you're not familiar with the Bible, please just keep turning pages. Just, just get there. It's in the Old Testament. It's, it's pretty near the center. If you, go, if you go too far, if you get to Psalms, you've got to go back to the east a little bit, or to the west, depending on if you're me or you. And if you're directionally challenged, it might be south. Who knows? Kimmy? You're probably sitting there going, what's north and what... What? East? What? No, I'm just kidding. Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Starting in verse... Let's start in verse 1. Now let's just read verse 2 and 3. Proverbs chapter 21, starting in verse 2, and I'm reading from my NLT. It says this. It says, People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. Just stop right there for a second. People might be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. You see, this is where we come back to. We can look at ourselves and we can think, I, I got this. I'm doing good. I, I, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. We can even hear it from other people. You, I'm, I'm the greatest. Just ask Josiah, ask Jason, a ask Amy, ask Kevin. They, they all think I'm the greatest. I must be doing something right. And so now we become content because externally we're like, okay, I must be doing good. These people think highly of me. But then there is this extremely powerful verse that comes up. He says this, the second half of this. So people may be right in their own eyes. You might think you're doing great. But he says this, but the Lord examines their heart. 
But the Lord examines their heart. Verse, verse 3, look at this now. It says this, The Lord is more pleased when we do what is right and just than when we offer Him sacrifices. You see, we get this idea that God is just after these eternal or this external sacrifice. What God is after in verse 2, what He's after is our heart. What do we know to be true from the Bible? That everything we do comes from our hearts. Everything we say comes from our heart. It comes from the control center, the tower of our video game setup. That's where everything comes from. If we're mean, if we're angry, if we're filled with unforgiveness, that's all that comes out. If we're we're filled with this anger and this hatred, that's going to come out. Because it's out of this control center that the mouth speaks. It's out of this control center that we live. The Lord, the Lord weighs your hearts. Why is it so important that we as a church pause for time to address where's our heart at? Why is it so important that we as a church pause and say, what's our motivation for doing the things that we're doing right here? Because God doesn't look at all the external. Doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Doesn't mean we're not supposed to do it. We know this to be true. A faith is a faith in action. That's a healthy faith, but it comes from our hearts. And that's what the Lord weighs. Flip back to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Just a few back to that direction, whichever one it is for you. Go down in numbers. That's all I'm going to tell you. Proverbs chapter 4. I want to read four verses here, I think, maybe seven. Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 20. says this, and this is the book of wisdom, so I think we should pay attention. It says, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Verse 23, and if you have your Bible or your phone, your app, highlight verse 23, because this right here is powerful. He says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The control center Makes sense, doesn't it? Guard your heart above all else, for it determines your life. Verse 24, avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. And you know what I love about this? I love that he's talking, in my opinion right now, this scripture, this is perfect for believers. This is perfect for the church because he's talking about a heart, a heart that's already following. And what he's saying is this, guard your heart. Put a firewall around that control center so that nobody, so that nothing can penetrate it above all else. Guard your heart. Young people, you're here, you're sitting in church on a Sunday morning. The Lord is speaking to you today. The Holy Spirit is stirring in you today. And you have a hard road ahead of you. And this this chunk of scripture right now is so perfect for you kids. Stay focused where you need to focus. Be intentional with the moves you make. Trust that God is going to provide for you. That God is going to protect you. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get pulled off. Above all else, guard that control center. Because it's out of the heart. That's the direction that your life is going to go. You guys, there's, th- you guys, there's three things today that I want to kind of close the message with. Three things to encourage us. Three ways, if you will, that we can guard our hearts. And, and, and I want to use a word, and, and I think it's very fitting, and it's the word fit. And I've used it a few different times, actually a few years ago. It was my first message of the year. It was the word fit. Three things that we need to do, and I think it's so fitting for this, because when I think of guarding our hearts, when we talk about being healthy, one of the most important things that you and I need to do to be healthy is we need to, we need to make sure our heart is healthy, physically. We need to make sure that our heart is healthy. So you can't, I, I like to exercise. I, I like to. I have a gym membership, um, but one of my favorite things about this gym I go to is that when I walk in the door, and I very strategically go in the door I go in, 
because I walk in the door this way, and off to the right side, there's all of these clothes dryers set up. And then on the left side, there's all these weights. So the right side, all these clothes dryers, it's all of these things, they're like treadmills, stair steppers, I mean, it's all these machines that, in my opinion, that's, that's what they're for. If you wash your clothes, you hang your clothes on them. How many of you got a treadmill at home, and that's kind of what it's used for? Huh? Yeah. You just drape clothes over it. Miriam doesn't. She's got a whole little gym downstairs. But, but that's my problem. My problem is I, I personally, I like to lift weights. I enjoy it. It makes me feel good. It gets my head right. I enjoy it. But I also know this. I know that if I really want to be heart healthy, if I want to exercise so I can live as long as Doggo has, I, I really need to start doing cardio stuff. Because it's that cardio that really makes your heart healthy. Amy's nodding her head like, yep. That's right, Bill. You got to do that. But I don't like it. <laughs> it's not fun for me. But I know I need to do it. And that's why you guys hear this. In order to really be fit, in order to be fit, you have, you have to take care of your heart. Again, the outside can look as good as you want it to. It's the inside. This is really what's going to make you live longer. The condition on the inside. And, and that's why I chose these, this word, fit. Because I really want it to stay with you. When you leave today, I want this word in your heart and in mind. I want to be fit. I want to guard my heart. Above all else, God, I want to guard my heart. Three things that I think help us stay fit. Guarding our heart. The first is this. To be focused. Write that down. Focused. And you're going to focus on two things. And this is Jesus' words. This is Jesus' direction, you guys. When Jesus is challenged and Jesus is being questioned, what are the two greatest commandments? You guys know this. What does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your, with all your, and with all your, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He says to love the Lord your God with everything you have. So what does it look like to love God? Jesus says, if you, obey my, if you obey my commandments, you love me. If you obey me, you love me. Jesus is saying this. And when you serve, and when you pray, and when you fast, when you worship, this is what it means to love God. Let me ask you this. Um, is anybody in here a uh, Timberwolves fan? Raise your hand if you're a Timberwolves fan. Yeah. It's a basketball team. That's great. There's four of you. Anybody in here a, a Packers fan? Crickets. I know it. Anybody in here a Vikings fan? Yeah. You know what's funny, though? She made more noise than all of you did. Unbelievable. Here's the reason I say all of this. How do you know somebody is a passionate Vikings fan? What, what's the evidence of that? They wear clothing. My brother, last, uh, last year when the Vikings played the first of the two playoffs games, the one they won, the miracle play, the miracle game, my brother showed up at my mom and dad's house and he had his hair. My brother, if you don't know, he's got, he's got hair. He's probably got almost as much hair as Denise does. His is, he's got all his head of gray hair and he puts it back in a ponytail and his whole face was painted purple in his eyes and, and he had a goatee and that was gold and I think he looked awesome. I mean, it was great. Actually, I made it my profile picture on Facebook for a period of time. And then my daughter, I, I had to leave. I had a meeting, I think, uh, that day. And my youngest daughter was at my mom and dad's house when the game ended, when this play took place, right? It looked like they were going to lose until this play happened. And, and I talked to Madison, my youngest daughter, afterwards and she's like, Dad, I mean, she's like, she's serious. She's like, Dad. And Maddie's very reserved, and she's sweet. She's pretty calm. Dad, you wouldn't have believed how crazy Uncle Bob got. <laughs> she, said, <laughs> she said, Dad, I was scared. I mean, I was like, I was, I was sitting back. And it, it's so funny. She said, he just... He wouldn't stop yelling and jumping. He was going crazy. How do you know somebody's a Vikings fan? Because they go crazy, because they make it known. Church, we just had an opportunity to worship God. 
and I'm going I'm to step on some of your toes right now. We had an opportunity to worship God, and do you know what our worshiping of God looks like? We love God with all of our hearts, amen? amen. We do, and do you know what our worship looks like? This. Jesus, you're the lover of my soul. Jesus. Do you love God? you want to guard your heart, which my Bible says above all else we should do, love God. Don't just say it, but love God. Let him know it. Worship him. Tell him. Don't let it be inhibited by somebody else. We are more passionate about so many other things, things that will burn away, things that moth and rust can consume. than we are about loving God. And I'm not saying paint your face and scare my daughter. <laughs> but I'm saying, love God. Do you want to protect your heart? Be in his presence. Worship him, love him, glorify him. Pray. Fast, focus on the spiritual, not just the physical. Focus, have focus on, on God, loving God. The second thing, focus on loving people. Jesus says the second is, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says this, give Help, consider, turn in your Bibles to the right a little ways to Philippians. Philippians. It goes Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And, and turn to Philippians chapter 2, and, and just because at times gotten away, I've gotten a little distracted with things. I'm going to read these first four verses here. It's about loving people, having an attitude like Christ. It says this in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Verse 3, this is highlightable. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Verse 4, another one, underline it. Don't look out for your own interests. Don't look out only for your own interests. Doesn't mean you should ignore all of your own needs. But he says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Put others even before yourself. This is what it means to have the attitude of Christ. This is what it means to love other people. And if you want to guard your heart and keep it in the direction that it needs to be so that you don't get sidetracked, love people. Serve people. Help people. Because there's, I don't think there's, there's much that, that really feels better than, than serving people. Amen? Amen? Amen. The second thing, be intentional with your life. Be intentional with your life. This is the fit, the F, focus, the I, intentional with your life. If you want to guard your heart, friends, be in mind, be mindful of where are you going? Who are you doing things with? What are you doing? If you hang out with people constantly that are gamblers, it's only a matter of time before you start gambling. Uh, I, I know when I very first, many, many years ago, 20 plus years ago now, when I first started doing drugs, it was because I was always around people that did drugs. And it was only a matter of time before I started doing them. When I drank, I, I was good until I moved out of my mom and dad's house. <laughs> I was good and safe. It, it was... It was, it was was home. I was anti-drugs, and I was anti-smoking, and I was anti-alcohol and, and drinking as a, as a young person. I move out of my mom and dad's house. I get an apartment at like 18 and a half, 19, 
And it was only a matter of weeks before I started drinking, I started smoking, because that's what everybody around me was doing now. It's only a matter of time. You want to guard your heart? Friends, you've got to be mindful. Who are you surrounding yourself with? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Apostle Paul, he's, he's encouraging the believers in Corinth, and he's, he's talking about the resurrection because there is a sect of leaders, the Sadducees, who, who don't believe there's a resurrection, and then you have the Pharisees that believe there is resurrection, and, and what Paul was teaching and, and what we believe is in the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, therefore giving us resurrection. And, and the Sadducees, there were people coming in and they were trying to influence the church in Corinth by saying there is no resurrection. They were, they were influencing them. And Paul, in encouraging the church in Corinth, he makes this statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. He says this, he says, don't be misled. Don't let your guard down around your control center. Don't be misled. He says this. He says, good company, or bad company corrupts good character. Don't be misled. And you guys, this doesn't mean, a, a lot of people will say, well, then, so you're just judging me. You're just a judgy Christian then because you don't want to be around us because we drink. Nope. Doesn't have anything to do with it. it. It means I'm choosing what's best for me. You want to guard your heart? Be aware. Who do you let speak into your life? and make the best choice for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Finally, the third point. And this is where we go back to Matthew. Turn, turn your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 6. The third point of all of this stuff, you guys, is trust. Is trust. You want to guard your heart? Trust. You want to keep, keep from being focused on the wrong things? Trust. Jesus, in this whole chapter, I believe he addresses two points. And the two points are this. I, I believe overall he's addressing temptation. Don't give in to the temptations, he's saying. The first temptation is this. Don't give in to the temptation of doing your service, doing your good deeds to receive the reward from somebody immediate. Trust me, he says. Trust me. The reward that God has for you is so much greater. And then the second temptation he comes again is against his money. Don't look just to your money. Don't rely on, on this. Don't, don't focus on this treasure. 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 Don't focus on this. Trust me. And that's what he talks about here in Matthew chapter 6, this last chunk of scripture. It says this, verse 25, after he talks about not serving, you can't serve God in money, he comes to this. He says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? You guys, just want to stop right there. There's worries in this room. There's big-time worries in this room, and, and those of you that are worrying, can I just encourage you, trust God. Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonder, wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. He says, why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father, He already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of, of God. Verse 33, highlighter, underline this right here. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously. And He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. He gives us the answer in verse 33. All of this comes down, in my opinion, to this. He gives us the answer. So he says this, don't worry about all this stuff. 
Don't, don't get focused on all this. And here's why, friends, listen. Here's why, because when we get so focused on what we're going to eat, when we get so focused on how am I going to provide, what clothes are we going to wear, is the house going to be big enough, are the, are the cars going to be enough, is the jet ski going to be fun enough, is the motorcycle going to be... Forget that one. Is, is the snowmobile going to be exciting enough? Then you know what our mind is on? You know what our focus is on? Our focus is on how am I going to make all of this happen? How am I going to do this? And if I'm worried about what am I going to do and how am I going to make this happen, how am I seeking God in all of that? And that's what he, Jesus is saying right here. Don't focus on this stuff. Trust me. Seek first the kingdom of God. Worship first. Worship only. Listen for my voice. Because I want to invite you to stand this morning. I had an opportunity on, on Wednesday or Thursday. Nope, it was Friday. <laughs> Forgot what day it was for a minute there. I had an opportunity on Friday to have lunch with somebody um, down in Maplewood. And it was, really, it was a really great opportunity, but it, it was just funny. So uh, he says, here's where we're going to meet. It was at an Indian restaurant. And he gives me the, an- the address, 27 Century Avenue, Maplewood. He says Maplewood. So in my mind, I'm thinking Maplewood. Well, do you know what Maplewood is to me? The mall. And maybe a mile radius. I think Sam's Club is in Maplewood. I think Costco is in Maplewood. And there's a Cub Foods I used to deliver to when I drove truck. That's in Maplewood as well. That's Maplewood to me. Okay? So I punch this in my GPS. I leave the church. I'm going to make it maybe a couple minutes late. I'm supposed to meet at 12. Supposed to be there at 12.02. And guys, you know, the goal all of a sudden becomes beat the time that GPS gives you. Yeah. All right. And I'm on track for that because I'm gently going over the speed limit at this point. So I'm on track to beat it. The next direction my GPS gives me is I'm getting down by the cities or um, just, just past like 96 and all that on 35E. It tells me that I'm going to take Highway 52 south. And I'm like, what? I'm going to Maplewood. Maplewood does not include 52 South. Maplewood includes 61 through Hugo and White Bear and 694 to 61 or White Bear Avenue. That is all it includes. So my GPS is saying, okay, I want you the next exit. I want you, I want you to go down. I want you to take 52. So you know what I did? End route. <laughs> Get on the phone. So I decide I'm going to take 60, 694 East because the address is Maplewood. I've been around this area a long time. I know where Maplewood is. I got this. Call him. Hey, so my GPS is totally messed up. It says I got to take 52 or something like that. He says, yeah, well, probably, but so I said I'm on 694. Yeah, the best thing for you to do is just go to Century now and just go south about six miles. He said, are you kidding me? He said, yep, it's right down by 3M right down there. Yep, that's, that's perfect. My GPS was right. And so because I chose, I know better, I hit end route, and now I'm, I'm 15 minutes late, I'm humiliated. I mean, and there's all of this stuff. And, and here's why, as this is happening, I'm thinking, this is a great sermon illustration. It really is. It's great. Because you guys, do you know what I believe we need in our church? I believe we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our church. I really truly believe that. I, I don't believe we need to go crazy from the chandeliers and all that, but you know what we need? We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our church. And, and I believe that He's doing that. I don't believe it's something that we want to have happen. I believe it's something that's happening. I believe it's happening in our young people, our not young people. I believe it's happening, but you know what the variable is? It's how many of us, we 
We have our GPS going. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now today as you stand in this little church in this small town. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you and He's giving you direction. What are you going to do with the direction? I can't tell you how many times in my life when God has spoke to me, I've hit and route. Because I know better. And the Holy Spirit wants me to go this way. Just stay on 35E and take the exit for US 52 South. And I say, nope. (laughs) And I hit end route. Friends, I know this. I look out and I know some of you. And I know that your life is just like mine. Time after time, the Holy Spirit is speaking something to you and He's guiding you and He's leading you. Time after time, you start going. But then it's just not what you want. It's not what you're used to. It's not what you're familiar with. And so you hit end route and you go right back to what you're familiar with. The Proverbs says, above all, above all, guard your heart. Do you know what it takes to be obedient? Do you know what I didn't have in my GPS? I didn't have trust. Church, where's your heart today? Do you trust God? Do you trust God? I'm not saying quit your jobs. (laughs) It's not what I'm saying. We are to work. We are to provide. Do you trust God? Have you surrendered your heart to Jesus? Not do you go to church, not are you serving on the worship team, not do you donate a lot of money, not does it look really good, but have you surrendered your heart to Jesus? Do you trust him? Do you trust that his ways are better than your ways? Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Lock that in your memory. When you want to go the opposite direction that you feel the Holy Spirit is is telling you to, that's, that's the scripture that should come to our minds that should come back up. Isaiah 55, 8, 9. It says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are greater than your thoughts. That's the direction that we should be following. Young and old alike. It doesn't matter. We should be following the direction, the leading of the Holy Spirit in church. When we do that, do you know what we see? We see in Jesus' name people getting saved. We see in Jesus' name people getting set free from addiction. We see in Jesus' name people set free from from spiritual oppression. We see a community that's changed. We, we, We sing a song. We need to come back to God. Give the world back to God. Church, God wants to use us to go out and reach the world that we say we want to reach. Do we trust Him? Is our heart focused on Him? Because believers, if our heart is not, why do we get so upset when we see unchurched and unsaved people not following him? That question should always come back to this right here. What's in my control center? Above all else, above all else, guard your heart. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and he will provide. Do you trust him? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word.